Hey, what's up? Mr. Bill here, and welcome to the Mr. Bill podcast. Today, I'm introducing the podcast myself um, because I feel like I've been quite absent for a while now, and as a result, I should probably uh, make a little bit of a statement here before uh, the ensuing conversation with Mimi Page. So basically, I've been a little absent from everything, shows, podcasts, etc., due to uh, a pretty nasty drug addiction that I had um, with ketamine. Uh, it landed me in rehab for the past month. Uh, as I'm recording this, I'm 53 days sober, and I hope to be more on the ball with the podcast going forward, uh, as well as Twitch streaming, tutorials, and other stuff such as shows and whatnot. Uh, the conversation with Mimi that's about to happen, we talk about my addiction, we talk about um, the you know general toxicity in the industry, we talk about uh, just you know experiences and life in general, and you know, different ways in which we understand life and, and, and all that kind of good stuff. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Um, apologies for the absence. Uh, I hope that this level of accountability will keep me honest in the future. And yeah, I just, I hope to be more uh, responsible and, and there for my fan base going forward. So uh, thanks for the patience that you've uh, exercised whilst I've been absent and yeah, I hope uh, you enjoy the podcast going forward. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Hey, you're listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Hey, you are listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. Hey, you're 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 listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. yeah cool usually i'll just start recording and then from there i'll just like edit whatever um just gives us like whatever amount of conversation or content to work with um yeah my morning was like kind of uh <clears throat> i mean i only came in here at like 12 50 to record the podcast at one and i thought uh everything will just work but um yeah as you can see i've, I've recently just run my computer through the wall uh with like all these long ass cable runs and stuff just to get like the noise floor of the room down uh because i just built this studio and i was like fuck it i'm just gonna go all out and like build my dream studio kind of you know that's and, awesome yeah it was cool um so my buddy gardner uh built this whole room for me and it's like a ground up build so it's not like uh we re we well technically it's retrofitted from uh like an old room that used to be here but we totally like ripped everything out um and built like a whole decoupled floor and everything so the room is essentially like kind of floating in space like decoupled from everything else so there's no like mechanical noise transfer or anything that's incredible it's amazing it's really really cool and are, are you in yeah. a new house you moved into a new location i remember i think the last time we were talking you said you you got a new pad yeah i moved to atlanta um because yeah like this year has been like yeah insane for me it's been so bad and that's kind of why uh or bad and good but yeah uh like i went through basically a massive like drug addiction period and then went through rehab and everything so yeah i have to apologize for not being able to do the the other podcast that, that we'd planned to do um because yeah i was going through like all of that kind of stuff so yeah i just went to rehab for a month and i've only just been out for like 10 uh 15 days or something like that wow um, yeah so uh happily over that now and and can get back to the podcast and stuff which is cool so yeah you're my first guest back in months <laughs> that's amazing the timing was yeah. really interesting though because um i was just about to give birth and so it was like not a good time for me either and yeah um but i want to like thank you for being so transparent about that i mean it's interesting the last message i wrote you I was saying like I wasn't ready to be talking at all on any podcast um just because like with carrying a life and like a lot of the stuff that I've experienced in this industry I, it's not it, it's positive it's amazing but also very dark and creepy mm -hmm. and so like I didn't want to be talking about that but I had told you I was like you're you've got such an amazing um 
platform to be speaking on really deep issues. And um, I know when we talked before, I was just so happy to connect with you on that way. And so it was so interesting if that's, I didn't know that was going on in your life. And that literally was like this precipice of, you know, the last time I messaged you and then you had that experience. So, I mean, I think it's, if you wanted to talk about it, I mean, I think so many people um, would learn and heal from your journey. And um, that's what I think as artists we do. It's like we're a mirror to humanity if we're going and being that, you know, transparent with our craft, not just in the music, but as, you know, artists and beings, creators. So I, I would just love right. to hear your story and your journey. Yeah, I'm down to share it for sure. Um, so basically, I guess like for the longest time in Australia, like I was always a drinker. And then when I moved to America, I was like still a drinker. And I basically drank alcohol. That was my drug of choice for for, for the longest time, right? Um, and my habit with alcohol was nowhere near as bad as my habit with my next drug, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, <clears throat> It was still bad, but I was just, I was drinking like basically a six pack of beer a night in the studio kind of, and I would do that most nights, but then I would have periods of sobriety where I'd be like, all right, I'm not drinking for this month. I'm not drinking for this month. Like, and I was able to sort of like somewhat control it. Right. And I certainly was able to be <clears throat> fairly functional. Uh, you know, I was able to obviously, you know, launch this podcast, um, do what I've done in, in my music career, like all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then <clears throat> when I moved to San Francisco, uh i was living in a house with a, a bunch of people uh who would you know doing ketamine regularly and i was just around ketamine more often basically so i started trying that not that i hadn't done it before but like you know i'd started doing it more regularly and i was like oh cool like this kind of you know seems like a decent substitute for alcohol <laughs> you know maybe i could just do this instead so i started doing it you know a few times a week and then that turned into you know like pretty much every day and then that turned into you know just fucking all day every day basically so i was doing ketamine all day every day for like like 18 months or something wow. um which is yeah a lot it's it's expensive it takes a huge toll on your body uh yeah horrible fucking substance to be honest i mean not it's not a horrible substance um well, but what, the are, stuff... what are the high, what are the high what's what's your experience like the positive um that you that drew you to it initially uh it's a stress reliever it's tranquil makes you feel like you know high and chill um your problems seem less bad uh you seem more emotionally flexible or at least i, I could i do you know you know, it seems like I'm able to connect with people more without having like, you know, barriers there, um, you know, sort of in the same way that you know, maybe MDMA would, but obviously like it's a very different kind of emotional connection uh, or, or emotional flexibility that you gain uh, with ketamine, I think. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, basically, like I just got heavily into that and uh, due to like all the stuff surrounding it, with um depression therapy and stuff i was like oh, i'm so smart i've cured my depression <laughs> um yeah. but yeah it was at like a massive cost obviously to my physical health um and it caused all sorts of shit it caused me uh i went to jail at one point wow. um, for five days in san francisco like proper put me in a jumpsuit and like went into jail what, what, um, do you mind sharing like what happened yeah, it was a domestic dispute between me and my partner at the time. Uh, she was trying to take my ketamine from me and I basically like grabbed the bag and pulled it back off her and she fell back and then she felt unsafe around me because I was high. So she called the police um, because she just didn't know what else to do, which is totally reasonable. Like a high person around you who's doing something like that, you know, they're, they may be li liable to do whatever. In my mind, I wasn't like, I definitely was not like trying to hurt her or, or anything like that. Like I was just trying to get my ketamine back. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but when someone's called, like the police are called, they have to take someone for a domestic dispute like that. So they took me obviously, cause she was the one who called. Um, and they took me in on a Thursday night and then they don't process cases on Friday, Saturday or Sunday. And then Monday was Labor Day weekend. So they weren't processing cases then either. Uh, so I got out on Tuesday. So I was just like hanging out mm. with these like fucking mean people for like five days. It was very, very scary. Wow. Um, one of the worst experiences of my life for sure. And after I got out of there, I was like, all right, never doing it again. Didn't do it for like 12 days and then jump straight back in. 
It's fucking oh. d- dumb. So dumb. And like, <clears throat> it's just hellish, man. Addiction is hellish. It's like shit like that will happen. And in your mind, you're just like, this is fine. This is normal. And it, it's because you keep normalizing things slowly over time. Right. And it's like, if you'd put me into the deep end from like a sober position, like I'm 52 days sober right now mm. if you, or 53 today. Um, Congrats. You, it's big. Thanks. Yeah. If you threw me into the deep end, like from, from where I am now, I'd be like, fuck this, this is insanity. <laughs> but mm-hmm. for some reason, like when you slowly normalize it up, you know, it, all of a sudden spending all of your money and time acquiring the drug and like getting into these ridiculous situations just becomes the new normal. And you're like, this is just life. And you don't really question it. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so the, the jail thing happened. I lost that partnership with with Jan, who I've talked about on the, and had on the podcast before, who's like probably best relationship I've ever had. Uh, so that was a, a real big shame. Um, kind of like, you know, my relationship with my manager took a lot of hits. Um, I ended up in hospital from an OD. A lot of people are like, oh, ketamine's fine. You do as much of it as you want and you won't OD. And while that may be true, it gives you a lot of cramps. Um, mm-hmm. so I was taking a lot of Tylenol and ibuprofen to deal with those cramps and just totally obliterated my liver. Uh, mm-hmm. so I ended up in hospital for four days on IVs, um, getting that all, you know, pumped out of my system. Um, you know, working closely with like poisons control and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, horrible, horrible shit. And then eventually it just got to the point where all of my friends around me were like, bro, you, you need to go to rehab. And, you know, I'd tried stuff, I'd tried meetings, I'd tried all sorts of shit. Um, but yeah, uh, rehab seemed to be the the only logical solution. So um, so I did that. And uh, yeah, I haven't really been transparent with people about this. Like, you know, on, on my social media, I would say like, oh, I just got to take a break for my mental health or I can't do this show for mental health or whatever. It's It was like, yes, mental health, if you class addiction as mental health, but I was just too fucked up to do the shows, to be honest. Like, yeah. I, I, if I had left my house and, and did Submersion Festival, like in the in the state I was in that weekend, I probably would have fucking killed myself. You know, like just with the amount of drugs I was doing and stuff. Because I wasn't only doing ketamine at that point. Towards the end, you know, I was doing so much shit to battle the negative consequences of ketamine. You know, so I was doing ketamine like to the nth degree. But then <clears throat> on top of that. Uh, at one point I was taking hydromorphone to like deal with the pain. Um, and then I started doing a bunch of like Tylenol and shit like that to like deal with the pain and, and just, uh, all sorts of shit like that. It just, yeah, took me down a really dark hole and ended up in a bunch of fucked up situations basically. And you're, you're so amazing to talk about this right now. Like, I just want to commend you because I know the bravery that it takes to talk about it. Just like going to rehab and then you know like being honest about what your experience is but then the fact that like you're using your platform to talk about this is just amazing so thank i'm I'm honored to be here with you right now i'm really grateful thank you of course yeah um so i think yeah a lot of people in the electronic industry um have similar problems and it's just very extremely normalized and that's they probably get to similar places that that I was in in my head you know where I was just like this is totally normal and okay to be doing this much shit um and as far as like talking about it honestly and admitting how bad it was and and obviously that it was all my fault and and stuff like that is not a problem for me at all but the only the only problem that I see with it is like um my immigration status you know because I gotta obviously get a green I'm applying for a green card right now Mm. Um, so if an immigration lawyer whips up this podcast and listens to it, it might cause a problem, but otherwise, uh, I think it should mostly be fine. Like I, I, I don't see fans and, and stuff like that necessarily losing respect, uh, for, for being honest about stuff like this. And if, and if they do, then I question whether or not they're like a real fan kind of, you know, I love that. I love that approach. It's so true. It's so true. And do you mind, what's your, how old are you? Do you mind me asking? I'm uh, 34 now, so. <laughs> so we're about the same age. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going through this big shift. I think 2022 is heavy for a lot of people. I think mm-hmm. since COVID, I, we've all had to like really confront a lot of crazy shit, um, you know, personally and then collectively in our business, the way that things have been happening, you know, in the corners, the dark corners we haven't been looking at. So 
I think that your healing process right now is like so on point with like our age group, our generation, what we should be focusing on. Um, because, you know, like there's just the, the rate of like, you know, beneath the addiction, um, that there's, there's, there's something there that I think we should be discussing as artists and just collectively, like what's beneath that. What are we, you know, suppressing? What are we trying to heal with the substance? What is that? Um, and then looking at that, because if we can look at that and talk about that, I think that that illuminates, you know, the the, the bigger issue of how do we truly heal from this? Um, because, you know, we have to be as maturing artists, I think a beacon of light to the younger generation. Um, I grew up in the nineties, you know, we're the same age, um, idolizing really broken people which was amazing at the time and I thought that depression was awesome self-harm was like what you do um you know anger aggression that was like the momentum and like that fueled me I was super angry as a teenager I was so self-destructive and I didn't go to substance but I went to um horrible relationships and I used my career actually as like which was my big healing the past year for me was like looking at like how I've used this idea of my craft to fix the hole inside of me. And I didn't realize how much darkness was in that industry and the things that I were, I was suppressing, trying not to look at because this was my safe space. This was the place that I could create and have fun. And, and it was magical, but it was like, you know, not a healthy relationship, you know, and especially like the competition and the demands on us. Um, and then like just financially, you know, like the, the systems of, of compensation and, and all the different methods of, you know, how we're trying to still earn a living as artists, especially post COVID. And it's just like, it's so much that I'm just like, <laughs> there needs to be a way where we are able to, I think, ascend, not just the art, but just like the, the, how we can value ourselves as human beings who create and be an inspiration, a source of light, because you know, unlike the 90s, where there was so much like it was is amazing to be sad, it was amazing to be depressed. And like, that's part of the experience. And shadow work is part of that we have to honor that we're not happy all the time. But then living there, I think, you know, or just masking with substance and saying like, well, this is cool. This is just how it is. It's we've had too many deaths. We've had too much um, pain. We've lost so much of our peers, our friends, our family, um, that I just think that we have to have another narrative to keep moving forward. And it has to be um, one of, I think what you're saying right now is like, this was my reality. This is how I had to get out of it. And, you know, the transparency of this is just what it is. And how do we find a way out of the pain, you know, without masking any of it, without distracting ourselves? Um, that's where I would like to be, you know, like, in our generation trailblazers of gen z and then gen alpha you know like that we need to be like giving them inspiration like it's cool to be healing like that's awesome that's amazing um which you know i think long tangent <laughs> what 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 i would love to focus on with you like let's talk about like what's behind the addiction like what is that and then how do we get out of that Mm. Yeah, I mean, I definitely don't look at addiction anymore as, uh, like, say, a disease so much as as much as I look at it as a symptom to another thing. It's like the drug use is, yes, its own disease for sure, but it really, in my opinion, is a symptom to some other problem for sure. Uh, <clears throat> and I think, uh, like, a lot of personally my uh, like I, I can't speak for anyone else really but like for my own addiction um most of it stems from uh what I found uh through going through rehab was probably PTSD mm -hmm. um like uh there's these things called this something called an ACE score which is uh, an adverse childhood experiences score uh and if you have a score of four or more then your class is having PTSD and for every one extra point you get it like uh shit goes up exponentially uh, and then if you have a score of four um you're uh, like having depression for you and anxiety and, and all of that stuff like your chances for having all of that stuff goes up by like 
I don't know, a hundred times or something crazy like that. Uh, and for, and for every other point that you get after that, it goes up exponentially apparently. And I got a score of eight. So, <laughs> um, they were like, yeah, you have chronic PTSD. And I was like, oh, cool. That, that probably explains a lot. Uh, so, so maybe some of it comes from there. And I think, um, for me personally, the solution is probably going to be just a lot of type of like EMDR therapy and stuff like that to try and like dig up those traumas and, and get past them. Um, and we were probably, talking about that. Sorry to interrupt you, but do you remember right. our podcast last time? That's what we were. I was literally going through that when I talked to you. Yeah. Have you heard of ART as well? ART. Remind me what that is. Um, I don't know what the acronym exactly stands for. Let me Google it real quick so I don't speak out my ass. Um, it's basically a form of EMDR and it just works faster, apparently. No, have you done it? Have you, have you started it yet? Or are you? I, I started EMDR, yeah, uh, where they basically try to trigger like both sides of your brain, like bilaterally by either giving you two um, handheld sticks that vibrate like from side to side or with a light that like just basically moves from side to side, it like kind of strobes and mm -hmm. you just like follow it with your eyes whilst, with your they're, eyes. whilst they're giving you trauma. And apparently the bilateral stimulation of the brain whilst they're doing the therapy makes it more effective or something like that. Mm. Um, so I, I found it to be kind of interesting. I didn't find it to be as um, groundbreakingly insane as some of the other people at my rehab did. Like some of the people who were doing it were like, holy shit, this has like changed my life. Um, but they were also like insanely religious, you know, like I, I went to rehab in the Bible Belt <laughs> in um, wow. Pens Pensacola. So everyone there was like insanely, deeply, deeply spirit, uh, Christian. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was kind of, um, it was a crazy experience because I'm very much not religious. So yeah. to be around like that much religion at the same time, it's, it was, it was, <laughs> Yeah, quite the experience to be getting to to be sobering up around that. And then yeah. like, are, you, are you agnostic or are you an atheist or how do you how what do you believe? Um, no, I would not say I'm agnostic. Uh, and I don't think anyone can truly be agnostic. I don't really understand how that could be a thing, right? Yeah. Um, because there's always so, like if you ask an agnostic person, like, why are you agnostic? They'll start explaining to you like all of these logical reasons and shit. And you're like, well, you just believe that. Like that's <laughs> That doesn't, yeah. that's, that's still a belief, you know, <laughs> it's like, how do you have zero belief? That doesn't make yeah. any sense. Um, so I would say I'm probably, uh, atheistic or spiritual somewhere between the two. Cause I, I just personally think that we don't know what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Like so many things have happened in my life where I've been like, well, that defies like anything I believed before about this one thing, you know? And then, then all of a sudden I'm like, well, I guess I was wrong about that. Or we don't know. It's interesting. Like the way that I look at it, I'm pretty spiritual. I've, I've been my whole life. Um, only because I, I just, I think this world is so incredible. Whatever makes the grass grow. It's not me. Whatever makes the ocean move. It's not me. Um, you look up at the night sky. We don't know anything. Like look at the massive billions of, of galaxies and stars up there. Like uh, it's beyond me. So whatever that is, it, I think gives us music. You know, like it, 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 we're the vessel for that. And what's I think so interesting is like you are recovering in such like a heavily, even if it's like, you know, one perspective, because it's interesting. I moved to the Bible Belt and I'm, I'm not that, you know, <laughs> but I moved to the forest in the middle of nowhere from Los Angeles and I'm in the woods in East Texas and it is the Bible Belt, but I opened a metaphysical store that's kind of based on how I feel. It's just about like beauty and peace and being present. And there is something else. I don't know what that is, but I think it's love. Um, and the fact that you're recovering, even if it's not, you know, like <laughs> how you feel, there's something that is being held for you. That's like higher than us. And I think that like the miracle of, of healing is that it takes something higher than us. It, it, it takes something I think higher than science. There's, there's just something that is like a little extra. I don't know. I, I can't explain it, but like the fact that like you win it all, you know, is, is a miracle to me. Like the fact that you, you have a podcast talking about it is a miracle to me. Like that's something that's like 
really transcendent of, of the ego mind, you know, or whatever that voice was, it says, you know, like, don't do it, you know, you, you did. And so I, I don't know what it is. But I, I just my 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 faith is just something and in, in something love based and that is ethereal and not human. Um, so mm. I just think it's interesting. That was your surrounding as you were healing. Yeah, totally. Because one of the parts of AA is um, giving yourself up to like God or a higher power and basically admitting you have a problem and being like, I can't solve this problem by myself. I need like a higher power to basically take the wheel because clearly when I'm at the wheel, it doesn't go well. Um, and for me, obviously, I don't believe in God in the Christian sense that they were believing in him. And it was funny because a bunch of people there were like trying to convince me like, why don't you believe in God, all this kind of shit? And I'm like, dude, if you're born in India, like we'd just be talking about like something else, you know, like, or if you're born in like, you know, just any other part of the world, we'd essentially be talking about a different God. So I don't know, that just raises a red flag for me. Like we're all talking about the same thing. Yes. But like the way that you're talking about it and like creating this omnipotent being as like some white dude in the sky who controls <laughs> fucking how many animals can get onto an ark and shit like that is just... Yeah. <laughs> not not really my jam yes, <laughs> um, yes but but yeah i was uh uh thinking a lot actually about like the god thing in rehab and i think where i got to with it was um like god for me is just uh you can call it a higher power or whatever and the thing that is more powerful than me is um like my just holding myself to a higher standard uh and also like like my standards of of my work and my standards of uh being being present and there for my fan base and and all of that stuff is more powerful than i than me i think mm -hmm. it's like this whole thing now that exists that's that's a little bit bigger than i am and i just have to be there for it's like uh, i guess it, assuming some responsibility perhaps um you know like if somebody has a child they're like i have to be there to look after that child now like that's a more important thing than like me at my core doing whatever I want or yeah maybe it's giving up selflessness you know yeah uh, or sorry give, giving up selfishness for selfishness. for more for more selflessness yeah perhaps that's like what I'm talking about to some degree well, you know the the term the higher self you know that in, mm -hmm. in metaphysical spiritual community the higher self is your your well how I perceive it is it's your your etheric being it's it's your soul it's your highest potential um of greatness but also love your capacity to be whole and present um and so it's interesting that you know as human beings we are flawed and like when we sometimes take the wheel of our own lives there there's generational trauma there's ancestral trauma there's childhood wounding you know things that are subconscious that are taking the steering wheel and we are not even aware of that but that higher self is always there, you know? And so I think that that's the most spiritual perspective you can have is just honoring that thing. Like this is, and I think our, all of our higher selves to some degree are all connected. That's how we understand each other. And that's how music, like you said, like around the world, like different perspectives of God, whatever that is, we all get it, but it looks different. It, it's in a different language. It, it, mm. It's colored differently. How How are you able to write a song and your fan base all around the world, what, whatever language, whatever experience they had growing up, they can feel that. Like, what is that? That that's that's the higher self. It's it's something that I think we're all unified at, and that's how we meet there. And so, yeah, I think the 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 road we're on right now is just like cleaning up the human side of things. Like, it's you know living more from that higher perspective that higher place that we that we channel from as artists um if we can meet there as the human creating the art then we're kind of like a whole you know imbalanced being um which i think is just walking spirituality you're you're walking like in a kind of like i don't want to say elevated state but you're not like sunken into the depths of this like swamp of like trauma that i think so much of us do carry um, throughout our lives and then we just act and cover it up um, in certain ways mm. yeah talking about cleaning up the human side have, have you been paying attention to the ai stuff lately yeah um, I it's have. kind of crazy how much of a like that shit has just kicked into second gear lately i think it, it's like it went, it went from like being in development 
over the last few years and obviously like it was doing some stuff already to just being like readily available to the public to write like prompts into and, and generate like pretty high quality images and um at this point there's people i have a friend um who was able to take my entire music library which is at this point like 400 or 500 songs and i uh he ran them all through this ai thing that he built um i don't know exactly how he built it uh and it basically created an algorithm that every like i think every hour it spits out a wave file that's one minute long and is just like basically supposed to be a replication of my music <laughs> based on like just a, the data set of my entire discography but it doesn't Whoa. sound like amazing yet but but i can hear that it, that it could you know like it, it's starting to get there sort of like ai images were a few years ago they would spit out like you know some random blobs and shit and like look a bit pixelated and look like it could be an image you know it like sort of depicts an image that, that you've seen before and then you know if, if you just fast forward like two years from now i think that we're going to be there with music where you could just say take subtronics's whole thing or like whoever like whoever's entire library throw it in and then just be like all right we can just generate endless amounts of that now well, so it's like when, it, when you go to spotify then it's like you know how it's like this is mr bill or like this is mimi page or like mimi yeah. page radio or whatever yeah. it's like that that shit i think eventually is probably just going to be ai and it's just they're just going to generate songs of your caliber and and your style just endlessly and what i don't about, think we're that far off that i think we're like a couple of years off that what about the human voice though like ai cannot replicate it's getting really close have you seen those deep fakes that people are doing yet like for instance joe rogan right he obviously has like tons and tons of his voice online yeah. my friend ben jordan the other day i don't know if you've ever watched the ben and gear channel he uploaded a short of him speaking to himself where he deep faked both joe rogan's voice and jordan peterson's voice and was like having a like mock-up podcast conversation between joe rogan and jordan peterson where both characters were played by him and they sounded pretty much the same. like if you close your eyes and listen to it it sounds like you're listening to joe rogan and jordan peterson god that's trippy that's really <clears throat> trippy but yeah. i think that's it's like <laughs> I mean, how do you feel about that like how as, a, as an artist and as a musician how do you feel about well an that? An another point that i would like to make um is the human voice to a computer is no more complicated than really any other waveform uh, or any other complex waveform, right? Like white noise is like a complex waveform. The human voice is also just a complex waveform. So to to a computer, they're the same amount of complexity, I would assume. If not, white noise may, may, may even be more complex. Um, how do I feel about it? I would say um, in one regard obviously my brain makes an argument for it being a bad thing because then it like cheapens um you know humans art by oversaturating it making it like it's like inflation right it's like if you if you just print billions and billions of dollars then the dollar is worth less it's kind of like mm -hmm. if you just are able to print like a billion hours of Mimi page music then the ones that you made and spent so much time on are like worth less kind of right like there's an argument that can be made for that but then there's also the argument of like we made an ai that can play chess and can beat any chess player in the world but we still sit around watching humans play chess against each other and we still are in awe of the best chess players on earth mm -hmm. um so i don't know you know it's like we have cranes and shit like machinery that can lift up like giant massive tons of metal but we still go to the Olympics to watch somebody lift like a heavy thing over their head, you know, in Olympic weightlifting or whatever. So to some degree, I think there is um, some part of us as humans that likes to appreciate the um, the awesomeness and the uh, impressiveness of other human beings to be like, well, I know how difficult that is to do. And they spent their life trying to achieve it. And now I'm watching it and that's pretty impressive and I'll pay money to go see it or whatever. You know, it's like, yeah. that's, that's kind of how I feel about it a little bit. I, it might be like that or, um, you know, surely in functional circumstances where you need to move a giant piece of metal, you're not going to go ring up an Olympic weightlifter to come and move it like in a factory, you know, you're probably just going to use a crane. And I think, probably the same will will apply for AI music. It's like if you're just making YouTube videos and you just want some backing music for the sake of like having some backing music or something, yeah, you're probably not going to call up like Hans Zimmer to do that, you know, like you're probably just going to use some AI to generate it. And I don't know. I think maybe that's the way it'll go, but who knows?
Yeah, I know a lot of artists are really upset. Like I I did that generator and I was just like, okay, you know, let's just see what it looks like. And I'm not a visual artist, but I've fought through Napster. Like my whole upbringing was like, everyone telling me music doesn't make money. It's hard to do um, because people are pirating things. And now with AI, this fear of like, well, a composer is just going to be a computer now. And like your whole job, your profession will be obsolete. And it's just like, I'm just so tired of that negative perspective. Like I'm, I'm like, there has to be another way to survive. Like, you know, the survival momentum in me is like, okay, well, maybe we have to get creative with this. You know, you can't replicate the human soul. You can't. So maybe we have to, you know, harness deeper within ourselves to, to get this new elevated form of us and how we create. Um, you know, it, it's just like the, the world we live in now, you know, you have a podcast, but you're also an incredible artist. And, you know, like, it, it, there's so many different facets of us. So depending on just one method of like creation, I think is an outdated thing. I think that we have to be multi versed in so many different things now and, and see the capacity of what we can even do. Um, and if you don't have that resistance of like, hey, like this, like your form of income of just like doing jingles on YouTube or whatever, like that's going to be obsolete. You can have AI. Well, then don't spend your time thinking about that. Like, how can you innovate in a different direction? How can you, you know, think of different ways? Like, you know, one thing that blew my mind was I created my own virtual instrument. And I knew in a way that like, you know, if I had my voice playable and anyone could create with me, then yeah, like I wouldn't be that exclusive. You know, I don't want to be that exclusive. Like, I think it's magical that if I pass away, my voice will live on forever and you can always play me no matter what, you know, and, and that was just an ego shift within me of like, this is me just adapting to a new time in our humanity where this is just going to be a new form of innovation. Um, so I, 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 I've just seen so many people angry and I get it. And I, I totally like feel that. And that's a valid perspective of saying AI could take over careers. They could take over, you know, industries. I see that. I honor that. But my argument is, well, then how does that push us in a different direction? How can we innovate and see, you know, what's, what's capable and possible um, in a different direction, you know, maybe outside of music, outside of visual painting, like how can we, you know, there's, there's, you know, the times we're living in, you know, I think that we have to harness our own survival as getting back to addiction. How do we survive as a human race right now? Like we're facing like legitimate, like crazy shit, mental health wise, state of the world, um, wars are here, you know, like um, diseases, um, it, it, the suicide rate, children are just massively depressed, like focusing on something like being mad at AI, I think is like just valid. But I think that we have to look at the core, like how do we survive as human beings here right now? And how do we find joy in our human experience? Yeah, I in terms of like giving uh, what it is that makes you impressive as a musician away and giving other people the power to to just have that i actually think that's a healthy thing to do as a as an artist and i've done it in the same way via tutorials and <clears throat> part of me when i gave or when i when i still do give away like all the tricks that i know and and have spent like years or months or however long cultivating and figuring out um, part of me is like, well, no, I don't have that trick exclusive to me and therefore other people can sound identical to me, right? But even after giving away literally all of my information, I'm still yet to to see anybody who sends me a piece of music where I'm like, damn, that sounds exactly like something I would make, you know? Like it, it sounds, yes, like there's some tricks and stuff in there that I use and and you can tell that they've watched a lot of my tutorials and are influenced. Definitely, it's it's never like... a perfect replication or anything and and i think the reason why is because there's just so many crossroads in the music production process where <clears throat> you start doing one thing and regardless of the information that you have at every single decision point you're going to make some decision that's based off like your ears uh your biology of your ears um your environmental experiences like you know if you've grown up in like a place that's extremely loud or extremely abrasive you probably have worse hearing than somebody who's grown up in the woods mm. um 
your obviously peer influences, you know, like uh, who you hung around with a teenager, what kind of stuff you're listening to then, who you hang around now, what you're listening to now, like all, all of that kind of stuff plays into it. Um, you know, the scene that you're in, who's the most popular now is probably going to influence what you're doing, uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's just so many things. And, and if you put all those things together, the chances that two people are going to have identical uh outputs is just so ridiculous to think so i think it's uh honestly in my opinion putting out all of your tricks and all of uh your tools and all of that kind of stuff it just raises the level for uh the the playing field for the entire production industry and i think that's only healthy because then it just forces everyone to get better yeah. and like you're saying it's like we're all trying to just like get to a better higher version of ourselves and i think that that that's a good way to do it is to for everyone to to share what they have because obviously like people learn things at different rates right so it's like if i share what i learn at my rate you share what you learn at your rate and vice versa we we basically all save time because time is finite so or at least we think it is i'm pretty sure it is so <laughs> um <laughs> at least in this life so yeah. you know something that if we were just stuck here on earth by ourselves might take us an entire lifetime to get to we now learn by the age of like two you know and <laughs> yeah so i think that that's kind of cool and important to be doing oh yeah absolutely i, I and I, I think that you know as getting back to like our generation of being more mature artists as we age i i grew up in especially being a woman in the industry fearing age and I was looking to role models like, well, I want to, <laughs> should I be scared to turn 20? Like, this is crazy, you know? And like, I think talking about this and how we're going to nurture our next generation, it's not about competition. It's, you know, you're competing with yourself. You're competing with your highest version and having so much wisdom available to the younger generation. You know, I, I used to mentor at my old high school before I left LA. And one of the most beautiful things that I witnessed was that, you know, I'm teaching my production skills and my wisdom tips in my craft. <laughs> and it was focused on how it could help them express themselves. And I knew a lot of the, the children there weren't going to become professional musicians. What they were going to do, though, is have tools to just express themselves on a bad day. Or just, you know, write something beautiful to, for somebody that they love, you know. And so it's like thinking of the wisdom that we're gifting these younger people or even our peers, you know. It's like it's I think it's helping us all elevate. Like the more wisdom we share, we're elevating ourselves. We're elevating our whole culture. Um, it's like, a, you know, and as we age, we're going to be mentors. We're going to be holding um you know, love and not just competition. It's not like this, you know, I'm, I'm so tired of that energy. Um, we need to be supportive of everybody, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think um, a lot of that uh, competitive, negative type of competitive energy comes from the idea that um, what somebody else gains, somebody else loses. And I don't think that that's necessarily true at all. And I found that out. Um, by doing the whole polyamory thing actually which was my my last relationship in san francisco the one that i was like not stoked about losing mm -hmm. but um yeah i i found uh through reading some books but also like just experiencing it that um extra partners does not make me love another partner less or like another example mm -hmm. is like you have a child now do you think if you had a second child that you would love your first child half as much? Mm -hmm. Probably not, right? It doesn't work yeah. that way. Mm -hmm. And I think the same for like success in the industry is it works kind of the same way. I think it's like just because somebody else gets like twice as big doesn't mean you get half as big. It means like it, it's like way more complicated. It's like they uh, more more often than not, if my friends around me get popular, it helps my career that's mm -hmm. all like you know because then they come on my podcast i do remixes for them they put me on shows like all sorts of stuff a good example is ganja white knight right like um they're like massive now like one of the biggest dubstep acts on the planet and in 2014 we were like co-headlining shows together 
in like Minneapolis. And <clears throat> now if they play Minneapolis, they play to like a 20,000 person arena. It's like mm -hmm. insane. I'm still playing like 300 person rooms, but they'll put me on these shows, you know? So I get to like, I, I reap the benefits of, of them blowing up and getting massive too. And like, you know, Ben from Ganja has been on my podcast and I, you know, reap the benefits of his fan base being interested to come to my platform and listen to him talk and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think um, a rising tide raises all ships, so to yeah. speak. Well, it was interesting. You brought up a really good point, though, because I think you're speaking from a healthy perspective. Um, I think this is very healthy. You're thinking of the health of everybody. But last time we spoke, we were talking about our challenges in the industry. And sometimes we don't have that dynamic. We have mm. to fight for that. And, you know, speaking of children, yeah, I just had my first child absolutely like most elevating life-changing experience of my life and because I've worked so hard on myself um coming from kind of a troubled childhood mm -hmm. I know what not to do and I'm going to try my best to not do that um and if I ever do have a second child I would I would absolutely love mm -hmm. each child equally but I've I've witnessed with friends and you know certain situations that that's not always the case in childhood. There will be triangulation. There will be a parent that values one and pits one against the other. So I think what we're talking about is like a healthy mindset. And that mm. my question to you is like, how do we address the unhealth and how do we have this healthy vision transcend this unhealthy way of life? Because the industry that I entered into as, a, as an artist I felt was very unhealthy. Um, and maybe that was just my experience. Other people have different experiences, but there was so much of that competition, um, uh, manipulation. There's a lot of really dark things. Um, you know, how do we lead with health um, when there's still those unhealthy aspects and dynamics where we work and also just in the world? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's like such an impossible question to answer because uh so much of the default human condition is to be greedy and to have like all of these negative well i mean it's both right like you know i think the default human condition is a lot of things but uh one of them is greed and uh you know like wanting more uh and i think this is one of those uh traits of of humans that i think uh will destroy things that people think other things are going to solve like for example um, bitcoin is a good example right for instance people are like oh it's decentralized humans uh, are never going to be able to own all of this like it's all everyone owns it equally the banks don't like one bank doesn't own it or whatever and therefore it's going to solve everything and it's like no it's not like all that's going to happen is china is going to mine more than anybody or roger ver is going to own all of it or fucking elon musk will buy all of it and and these greedy fucks will just like own all of it. And then all of a sudden it's centralized again. It's like one person just has all of it or has most of it. And if they have most of it, then they, they can influence the space more than, than another person. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there's certain things in the music industry that are still like that. Like for instance, uh, having arguments with people about like whose name on the flyer has the bigger pixel size and all sorts of shit like that. And Unfortunately, that stuff does kind of matter because there's some sort of psychology that goes into, I think, a person seeing a flyer and being like, that person's name's the biggest, therefore I put them on a pedestal in my head versus these other people versus if, you know, flyers were just all the same size name every time. It doesn't like elevate that that bigger artist to look like larger than life kind of. And I think to some degree, people want that a little bit as well. It's like we've always wanted to have some sort of deity or, or whatever to look up to you know like jesus or something like that so we we yeah i think to some degree it's like a necessary evil to do that on the flyers and that's just one aspect obviously there's so many aspects i think of of where people seem to be like biting and and competing in these really just strange ways mm -hmm. um but yeah i don't know it's a really tough thing to think about and and solve i've thought about it in, in like many different perspectives over the years and i've just come to the conclusion that's just the way it is and, and mm -hmm. i just have to i can't change it i can't control that i can't let other pr people's problems become my problems and so i have to just try to control the things that i can control and that's obviously just me yeah. uh, so 
yeah, I try to keep that perspective these days because otherwise, um, that's what leads me down those, those bad paths, you know? Yeah. Well, I think you brought up a good point about leadership. You, you know, there will always be a hierarchy. There's always going to be, you know, people love to follow people. Um, but who's in leadership? You know, that was, that was part of uh, the campaign that I had worked on last year of, um, with Dan safe was, uh, public figure accountability and responsibility. And like, if you have a platform, if you're a leader, what are you leading with? Are you leading with a perspective that's healthy? You know, and and I think that that's what we can change. You know, if if we're in any, every everybody has a platform to a degree. It doesn't matter how small you are. You have an influence over somebody, even if it's one person. And so if you just work on yourself um, and you focus on being balanced and healthy here, um, that leadership is going to make ripples around everybody that is around you. Um, and so there will always be a hierarchy, but you're not having somebody at the top that's very destructive and harmful and having a narrative that's, you know, going to destruct and harm others. Um, so I think, you know, like you said perfectly, you can only focus on yourself, but I think le like leading with that message of like, here's how I'm working on myself. Self-work is amazing. I, I don't have it all together, but here's how I'm finding balance and here's my path forward. And that transparency is so beautiful. And then moving forward and inspiring others to do the same. I think that that, I think that inspires massive amounts of health around us, especially as artists in an industry that hasn't really led with a healthy mentality, you know? Mm. Yeah, totally. I think the industry at large um, necessarily doesn't lead with a an incredibly healthy mentality, especially some artists in particular. Like for a good example is John Summit, right? Like this dude who's just gotten massive over the last, I don't know, year or something like that. His entire brand is like, I'm fucked up all the time. I'm so drunk at the after party. Um, I'm on cocaine. Like he's, he's just constantly, if you look at his Twitter feed, he's just like, man, I'm so fucked up right now. I'm doing all this shit. And he still looks like really fit and like well put together. So, I mean, I've either got to think um, he's just an anomaly and he's able to pump down drugs more than anybody else and keep his shit together and stay productive. And and maybe he what he's doing is not classed as addiction um, uh, or he's getting real bad drugs and they're not really doing anything. <laughs> <one of> the <laughs> two. Maybe his deal is selling him vitamins, you know. But, but do you think in his mind, is he considering that, hey, a kid, you know, just growing up and looking at somebody to follow and doesn't have like the financial ability to, you know, have their needs met and also have these drugs that cost money, that cost time, can't mm -hmm. balance all of these things at the same time, how that's going to influence that one life, you know, like, and then the people around that artist, they're supporting that narrative, you know, how is that helping the other generation. I mean, I think it's parasitic in a way, you know, I don't know this artist, so I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just, you know, responding to what you're saying. And I just think that a narrative that's not physically, emotionally, and spiritually healthy and constructive for survival and to be flourishing here, um, is parasitic because you're taking, you know, energy from people watching you and you're laughing and joking and making a mockery out of what really kills so many people when it's not in balance, you know, mm. it's just disturbing to me. Yeah. If I were to guess, I would say, no, he's probably not thinking about that child who's following him and, and taking influence from that. If I were to guess his, his thought process probably goes something along the lines of, Hey, look, um, if he ever does see this, he's probably just going to be like, oh, fuck it. They're talking about me. Any exposure is good exposure. You know, success is the name of the game. And my brand of getting fucked up is what's making me successful and working for me right now. And so I'll keep pushing it. Right. Like if I were to guess, I'd say that's probably where his mind is at. And that's, that's totally fine. Um, if, if that's the path he's on and, and what he wants to do. Right. But yeah, I agree with you. I think it's like probably not the mess mess best message to be putting out. Uh, and there's, definitely been times you know in my past where i've made tweets about like being fucked up somewhere or like you know being an advocate for certain substances not necessarily anything other than psychedelics but um yeah i don't know i mean it's it's i obviously can't say exactly how john summer feels in his head all i know is like the 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 message that he's putting out certainly seems to be like party all the time it's fine <laughs> mm. which is uh 
it's just not how it is. It doesn't work that mm -hmm. way. Take it from me, the person who partied all the time. <laughs> it doesn't work. You eventually go to rehab or die or end up with no money and unsuccessful or like there's yeah, it just it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out that well. Yeah. And I'm so happy you're that's why you're talking about it, you know, because like when it's glamorized to that degree, it's just it's unsustainable. And also, you know, I right. just I, I it's just interesting. I I I'm I found myself, especially becoming a mom, um really uninspired to even compete in whatever former reality I was living in. I don't even care about it. I care about what this child is going to grow up in. What is the world they're going to grow up in? There's so many beautiful artists that don't have a ton of followers, you know, like some of my favorite artists, nobody's heard of them. And I think that, you know, they have massively successful careers because they've reached a lot of people, but they're not living from this place of, you know, it's kind of just, it's like the Wizard of Oz from hell. It's like, you know, sh showing this like flashy thing that's very destructive and luring a lot of people in, but it's not real and it's scary and it hurts people, you know? So I think I, I, I'm really, I think, inspired to not participate in that. And I found myself, you know, like, especially as an artist now, I love taking a step back and being about quality time, quality projects. And that's okay. If I disappear and my brand, you know, is just going to be what it is for the past 10 years I've contributed. And then I just add a little bit more here and add a little bit more here, but I'm happy. I'm healthy. I have, you know, a family and I've got beauty that I'm living in and I'm at peace. I think that's massively successful. And that's not the business model that I was taught or trained to participate in. Why is that not okay? Why is health, peace, serenity, raising a new generation of, of human being? Why is that not like, like a cool thing? You know, mm -hmm. like it's, it's bizarre to me. Um, I, I think to some degree that success, uh, that version of success is also pushed as well like the whole white picket fence family buy a house like all that kind of stuff but it's pushed in this like really sort of gross capitalistic way you know where it's like you need to do xyz systematic things to be a part of society as we see it in the west and do all of these things and as a result like i think it does probably keep a lot of um a lot of people in check and keeps them on a path uh to um to like men you know keeps their mental health good because they like constantly have some some goal and they constantly have some responsibility of having children and have a responsibility of like paying their bills and, and all of this kind of stuff i think to some degree it can it can be like probably helpful um <clears throat> but yeah i think we need to sort of like re re-gear it a little bit to be maybe less um capitalistic and maybe a little bit more um yeah, healthful, as you've been saying. Yeah, it's, it's not about numbers and just achieving this one thing. We've we've all done that. We have icons in every field. You know, we've maximized th that, maximized that type of structure. What what has it done for anybody? You know, like we're, we we need to be innovative in how we're like building in different directions. Like we're we're living in a time of a lot of confusion. Um, and I think it's self-indulgent to just focus on acquiring, um, just, it's just old, it's old energy, you know, like let's, let's give and feed new wisdom. Um, and, and speaking from like a female perspective, one of the most incredible things I, I did was just take a step back, embrace my age, become a mom. The physical process of creation was brutal. You know, like it was unbelievable. And I am just like, this is like the most creative thing I've ever done in my life. Like, oh my God. You know, and I just growing up heard so many negative things about aging, um, becoming a mom, living, you know, in a smaller area. It's not glamorous because I come from LA. And it's just like, it was all just a, a false narrative to me. Um, and it's just, I think that simplicity is so beautiful. It just takes you back to, you know, nothing is boring. It like like being being peaceful and you know what what's boring about being peaceful? 
you know, I think a lot, we all avoid peace to some degree because we've been traumatized so much. And so when we're trying to be silent and just quiet, it's loud and we have to look at that stuff. That's so loud, you know? So I, 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 I think that, I think at the core, what I'm trying to say is like this, like race to the top, I think is kind of trauma inspired. It's like, what are we trying to like run to and from? And like, even it's also being, trauma inducing, right? Yeah. It's trauma inducing. It's sick. It's like, mm. you know, I, and, and, but I, I will say, you know, to own your greatness, you know, they're, they're incredible artists that how, how big can you grow? Like, that's beautiful, you know, not to knock growth, but it's like, when you focus on that, that's the model and the structure to have a career and to strive and, and thrive. I just don't think that that's the way, the only way, you know, there, there's a, a more well-rounded experience right now. Um, that, yeah. Mm. You and, could also and, look at it backwards too, though, right? It's like having the well-rounded experience and the peace experience and all of that stuff is also not the only way to happiness as well. I think like for different people, different things make them happy, right? Like I got a bunch of friends and a good example has Ben from Ganja White Nights, fucking super happy. He's pretty, you know, I'm assuming he probably takes on a lot of stress as well to try and like get to where he's gotten and to try and maintain it. And he works really hard, but like at the same time, he doesn't seem like he's in some like unhealthy mindset about it. You know, he seems like genuinely happy. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, just for different people, it works differently. You know, like uh, I got another buddy, um, Squanto, who's been on the podcast before. He's actually, a lot of people don't like him because he got canceled a while ago for saying a bunch of shit on Twitter. But I mean, he's the dude who who drove me to rehab and got my ass in the car and took me there. So I have a lot of respect wow. for him. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he's since like put out an apology letter and stuff. And I think it was really well thought out. But he he also went to rehab but uh yeah he, for, for him like he tried to do the thing where he got massive as well and it completely destroyed him he had a full-on psychosis and like went through this like crazy thing ended up going to rehab and shit same as me you know mm. um different situation in his case but yeah i think you know for some people that's the result and for other people you get like you know people like ben from ganja who are completely level-headed and and having a great life and yeah he has a kid or two now actually and you know he's chilling so yeah, I think um just for different different people who are geared different ways, you just gotta find like your natural rhythm and natural flow that you fall into for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and having that be just available wisdom, just like whatever if you're if you're at your own state of peace, like you are balanced within yourself, you feel good, you're not escaping, you're not self-destructive, you're not destructive to the people around you and just keeping that in check, like your own trajectory is just your, when you, when you garden, you, you plant a seed in the ground and it's going to grow how massively it wants to grow. That's the intelligence of the seed. That's what we have within us. Um, I just think that, you know, talking about a lot of this stuff that is, is darker, I think helps clear out um, more growth for massive success of rising with health. You know, um, I, I love hearing the opinions and perspectives of artists that have families um, um, that are that have gone to rehab and had these shadow like experiences like you you have because that's just so relatable. You know, you're not you're not masking your pain with like this is the way to be. You know, like you're like saying like man, I went through it and like damn, like <laughs> this is this is you know. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, speaking of uh, you know, grinding and trying to get to the top, I actually have to go now and work on a set for this weekend with uh, my buddy Chris Killsmith. We're playing in Columbus this weekend, so awesome. We have to work on what we're gonna play and figure it out. That's awesome. That's so cool. Um, how do you feel today? Just like how you do? I feel good. I'm doing good. I woke up. Um, I've been uh, I've been trying to get my like sleep a little better my sleeping is so fucked it's always been fucked mm. um i've been trying to get my ass to bed by midnight like just to up my chances of going to sleep you know like even if i don't feel tired i'm like i'm just gonna go put myself in bed at midnight and that will like you know maybe up my chances of sleeping and i take meds now at night um to try and put myself to sleep i take uh 50 milligrams of seroquel and 10 milligrams of melatonin mm. um <clears throat> So that's been helping a little. Uh, they got me started on that in rehab because I was just like, I, I was just like, I can't sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
And that's been helping a little bit, but still, I mean, even with that, I didn't get to sleep last night until like 4 a.m. So I woke up at like midday today and a couple of days ago, I woke up at 5 p.m. It's like my sleep is just so crazy. It's all over the place. But yeah, Mm. I I really would like to get into like a routine of like midnight sleep, like 9 a.m. wake up or something around that realm. Because I feel like when I get up earlier, when the sun is still in low solar angle, I just feel better. And I think it has a lot to do with that. Um uh getting a lot of like low solar angle lux into your eyes at that time of the morning when when it is at that angle it like triggers something in your brain to go like all right it's morning like daytime let's like start the fucking engine whereas when the sun is in like high solar angle or like at the other side of the world um it triggers the opposite response which is like we we now know that the lux are coming from that direction it triggers your brain to to shut shit down and then Yeah, just I just have worse days when I wake up later. So I've been trying to wake up earlier. Um, so today I'm sort of in the middle. Like I woke up halfway through the day, so I'm like, the engine's half going. Half going. <laughs> have yeah. do you? And it's a bizarre question, but um, physically, because I know that you're probably yeah. still fresh out of this. Do you ever take baths or do yoga just to physically relax your nervous system? Yeah, I do. I should do yoga more though, for sure. I should exercise more, hundred percent. Because yeah, it's like shocking your nervous system with like weights or yoga or just any physical movement it's like yeah, it's so much better otherwise i get like twitchy and like feel all pent up and shit and yeah, yeah. well restorative yoga before bed if you just do um you can youtube there's just so many different stretching poses um mm-hmm. amazing people where you're just giving space to your muscles where you have in stored tension and then mm. breathing like your breath is so important um you just are you know getting out all of that anxiety just breathing and doing deep you know breathings while you're opening up space in your body and then um I, do you listen to solfeggio frequencies at all do you know what uh, those are is that is that the so uh melee d what the is that self solfege well, it's more like um just pull I'll, I'll send you some um the, they're just like 432 hertz um uh. different of, of more like pulsating healing frequencies like so I, I think the 432 hertz thing is bullshit just by the, way. <laughs> the reason be. there's a good adam neely video i'll send you on it uh, yeah yeah so the as far as i know the argument for the 432 hertz is not actually just tuning stuff down by eight cents but rather um working in like non-equal temperament scales where like each note is not um, an equal distance apart to break up the octave. It's like the distance between like the first semitone is like different to the distance between the second and third semitone and so on and so forth up the scale. So it's like a slightly different type of scale. Mm. Um, some people think that that's like what makes it more healing or whatever. And and in electronic music, it becomes kind of difficult to work with those scales because yeah. there's only so many synths that can take the dot ton files that will give you those non-equal temperament scales. Like Zebra takes them, Bazil takes them. I think maybe Serum might, Contact might. There's a few, but like not all of them do. Mm. But uh, the good argument that Adam Neely makes is um, like if you think about what a hurt is in the first place, is it's just a measurement of cycles per second, right? So like one hurt is one cycle per second 440 hertz is 440 cycles per second but the measurement of a second is actually off like what a measurement of a second (laughs) is is like um it's got something to do with like uh it's either got something to do with like rotation of the earth of which 24 hours is not an entire day it's actually like 23.97 or something and so seconds are actually slightly off which is why we have leap years Mm. uh or it has something to do, and this might actually be an atomic clock thing, um, the amount of time it takes a water particle to do something. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> the point is that uh, 440 hertz even is not necessarily 440 cycles per second anyway, because a second is like an incorrect measurement of time in the first place. Yeah. This specifically, though, is not as as technical. It's more of a, a vibration that you're feeling. Mm. Um, I'm going to send you, um, a couple and maybe you can put links on this, but, um, they're just, um, they're like sound blankets. And so Mm -hmm. if you try it, um, put your headphones on and just breathe and listen to just the frequencies, um, pulsing. I also do sound healing with the sound healing bowls, um, and giving sound baths and the actual vibrations, um, working on your physical body. 
um, cause we're made of water. And so, you know, we're, we're reacting to those physical stimulants. And so it really relaxes you. And if you just, um, put them on, you know, like binaural beats, um, mm-hmm. th- that the frequencies are going at the same time, it really is healing, especially if you can't get to sleep and you just put it on and you just focus on deep breathing, like your whole system, your body starts reacting to that flow. And then it starts just relaxing and it just worked mm-hmm. for me. And, you know, I, I did EMDR. I, I, I've worked with a lot of um, stuff that, that I needed to find relaxation with. And it really helped me. Um, mm. so, yeah. I'll send you some of those because I, it's hard. You need your sleep, but it, it, it works. I think. Yeah. I'm definitely down to try it. My mindset with things like that in the past have been like more logical and, and stuff like that. But my mindset these days is more like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. I'll try whatever. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Yeah. But like in general, my mind still has this knee jerk reaction to think stuff like I, I would say the reason why a binaural beat works is because just the activity of listening to it puts you into the mindset of being uh, intentional with wanting to be in tune with your body because you're like, all right, binaural beats, let's go. I'm going to be in tune with my body right now. And like, you just, you set that intention and you do the thing and the binaural beat is just the thing that like causes you to, to want to sit there and actually pay attention to your body for a second. Right. Whereas if you weren't listening to the binaural beat, maybe you wouldn't do that. You'd just be like, I'm just going to like fuck around or do whatever. Sort of like you know, people think vinyl sounds better when it just objectively does not. But the reason why I think is because they put it on and because they're like physically going to the effort of like loading a vinyl disc onto the player and putting the needle into it and like specifically yeah. listening to it through their good hi-fi speakers, then they'll go sit right in the middle of both speakers and be very intentional about listening to it, you know? So mm-hmm. they're paying attention more versus... <clears throat> if they just like put on Spotify in the background, it doesn't seem as ceremonial. So yeah. they don't like pay as much attention to the music and therefore that's just whatever. When Spotify objectively sounds a lot better. Um, yeah. Well, so let me, it, ask, you some, let me yeah, ask you something. Though. There's another right. example of this as well that I would like to bring up is um steroid use. Uh, a lot of people say like, oh, I took steroids and then I got massive, right? Um, but in actual fact, I think a lot of the reason why people get big on steroids is because once they start doing the steroid course, they never miss a meal, they eat extremely cleanly and they work Mm -hmm. out like twice a day. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just did all of those things and didn't take the steroids, you'd probably just get like just as big as well. Right. But, but the Mm -hmm. action of taking the steroids makes you like try that much harder. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, yeah, I would say the same thing applies a little with the binaural beat thing. Like it just makes you pay more attention because you're going to the effort of like putting the thing on anyway that's that's my knee-jerk reaction thought there yeah well let me ask you because i I love how analytical you are and that's that's an approach (laughs) that you're dissecting it that way um have you ever done sensory deprivation like a flow i have yeah i did it once and i uh couldn't really stay engaged with it because um the door had like a it was like a two so there's like two railings next to each other to get into the door, right? One was to sort of like lean on and the other one was to grab the door and pull the door open. And I was like, man, someone could just like put a broom through there and I'd be stuck in here. <laughs> so wow. I constantly was like pushing it open to like make sure it would still open. And also my phone was like out there and shit. And I was like, someone could just like steal my phone. And then the other thing that was um, keeping me from like fully submitting to it was that um, you're so buoyant in there. I was like, kind of just like pushing myself off the edges and stuff around the tank. And it was really fun. So I was like, (laughs) I I just couldn't stay engaged, but there was a bunch of reasons. Yeah. Oh, that's so amazing. Well, it's interesting though, because when you are absent and I was going to have this as a suggestion, um, meditation is the hardest thing. And so it literally Mm. forces you to stop everything, stop the thought, stop analyzing everything. Like, don't even think about it. Don't think of how this is helping, why this is, what is this doing? Um, is, you know, like drop all the thoughts, drop all of it. Nothing matters. And so that sensory deprivation that brings up so like what you said, like I could die in here. Someone could steal from me. Um, this is fun though. All distractions, all yeah. distractions. Totally. The, the most amazing thing, which goes back to like the solfeggio, is like it's absence, absent of melody. Melody is a language, so you mm-hmm. literally are not even listening to anything. The sound is just padding so that you're not alone in your thoughts. Um, but if you hold meditation and literally 
like I, I trained with some monks back in LA. Um, it was so powerful for me to not try to figure out a fix or try to find some peace. It was literally let everything in your head go. Like you don't need it. Your mind will scream at you like it did for you. And it's a, just put, put your thought on a little river and just let it go. Well, I have to do this. This could happen to me. This is, none of it matters. None of it matters. Mm. None of it matters. And, you know, if you've done psychedelics, um, I, I found that experience to be um, matching where, you know, <laughs> like um, psilocybin has been very healing. It literally, I, I felt like nothing matters. Like n- none of my thoughts matter. Um, and that would help you sleep is if you just, all the thoughts, okay, someone could hurt me. I could lose this. I don't want to do this, blah, 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 blah. And you just look at the, the whole stack of thoughts and none of it matters. Nothing matters. Mm. Just flick it away and then just be nothing. And then mm. boom, there's your peace. It's so hard. That's it is, what I yeah. practice. It's impossible, man. Like the default human condition, or at least my default, is to just do things in my head cerebrally. Like it's and it yeah. Uh, Sam Harris has a good way of putting it. He says when he tries to meditate, he feels like he's being hijacked by the most boring person alive. <laughs> which, which is exactly how I feel too. It's like, as soon as I start trying to meditate, I'm like, I have to update my credit card in my gas company thing. I, I forgot about that. And like, oh shit, I should probably get a haircut. I'm like, oh man, I wonder if like that tap out in my garage is going to freeze over in the winter. It doesn't really get that cold in Atlanta, but maybe, you know, like <laughs> I start just like thinking all of this kind of shit, you know, like what if somebody sets off like a nuclear bomb in Pakistan, you know, like just all this random shit, uh, yeah. like thought after thought after thought. And it's just like, it's, literally chaos if you if you like yeah. actually pay attention to like what's going on there you you're like if you just like had a computer yeah. that was like outputting all of this as text and you're sitting there reading it you'd just be like this is fucking bullshit like who's right <laughs> you're like this that's, is literal like nonsense yeah that's that's like the sensory deprivation thing i think is that's would be so good to practice you know sleeping or just releasing that or just sitting with your thoughts and doing that it's like going to the gym of peace. Yeah. Like you go and you jump on the treadmill of not moving anywhere. You're not going to achieve anything. Mm. You're just nothing. And then, cause if you really logically though, if you analyze what have all these thoughts gotten any of us, like, yeah, we're just dancing around in 2022 on a tiny rock floating in space. Like it's also silly. Like, what is this doing for anybody? You know, how are we feeling? <laughs> drop mm. it all, drop the story, just drop it all. Just be nothing for like five yeah. minutes. It's amazing. It'll change your life. <laughs> mm. Yeah, just like uh, recovery, right? It's uh, simple, but it's not easy. No, God. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's it's a daily practice. I, I have to clock in. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> it's it's my, my daily practice. Is drop your head. Just drop it all. And mm. then it's just like... Oh. And I realize how much you just carry like in your physical body. All your thoughts are just like overwhelming. And it's just like... I carry that, that, that programming every day, all the time. Like, oh my God. And then you go on social media, you go on this, it's just like thrown at you. And it's just like all the time is exhausting. You just like, mm-hmm. just put it away, put it away. And the healing is in that dark space where you're boring. That's where the healing really is. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. I, I really appreciated this chat and, um, yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your day and yeah, best of luck to you and your child and your family and everything else until next time we chat. Thank you, Bill. Much love. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, what's up? Thanks for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. This show is produced and edited by Robert Fumo. You can get early access to the show by going to my website, mrbillstunes.com and paying me instead of Patreon. And remember to go rate and review on iTunes or I'm going to come to your house and punch your dog in the throat, upper deck your toilet and fuck your partner. Note, I may or may not do those last couple of things. Uh, You should probably just go rate it on iTunes or Spotify or whatever it is that you listen to the podcast on because it really helps the podcast. Um, But but just know that that it'll go a long fucking way to me not doing those things if you do go do that. So uh, just just put that out there.